أنا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مدن له ومن يبدل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه تسليم كثيرا أما بعض فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم تسليم كثيرا وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة Dalalatu wa kula dalalatin fillari Last time we came together we began to touch the surface of the explanation Hadith number 3 from the 40 hadith of an Imam an Nawawi Sharaf al-Din Abi al-Zakariya Rahmatullahi alayhi The hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar رضي الله عنهما وأرضاهما in which he said that the Prophet informed us صلى الله عليه وسلم that an Islam has been built upon five pillars and the first pillar was the pillar of the Shahadatain so we dealt with the first part of the Shahada the Urwat al-Wufqa and the Kalimat al-Tayyiba لا إله إلا الله شهد الله أنه لا إله إلا هو والملائكة وأولو العلم قائم بالقسط We dealt with the virtues of لا إله إلا الله We dealt with some of the virtues of لا إله إلا الله And we also dealt with how لا إله إلا الله comes in the Qur'an in different formulas. How La ilaha illallah has been interpreted and explained by some of the Salaf as being called different things, like the pure word. Al-Kalima al-Tayyiba. We also talked about the arkan of La ilaha illallah, the pillars of La ilaha illallah. Some issues connected to it. And as we mentioned, since is the most important and the most powerful aspect of the deen of Islam, this kenima of monotheism, it clearly is going to be deep in knowledge. So a lot of things to talk about. And if the teacher would go through the details of Ma'i Ma'i Allah, the Muslim community, he would be doing them a favor and doing a wajib upon himself and upon him because the Ummah of Islam, for the most part, have lost the true meaning of La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah, the shahada, the first part. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam put a lot of emphasis on this issue. Like the one who makes wudu, one of the dua that he makes after making wudu is the shahad. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna Muhammad abduhu wa rasuluh. It's one of the duas that you make every day after performing wudu. Show me the importance of it. There's so many issues. When the Muslims come together, and there is an assembly. Even if we come together for our kikah, for our walima, for a cup of tea, we meet each other in the park, and we sit down on the park bench, we sit down on a blanket collectively, and we spend some time together, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour, two hours. We come from a, for a lecture, and we spend time together. The Prophet told us, وسلم, if a group of Muslims do that collectively, and then if they say, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. And he says that with the shahada in it, 
anything that they said in that assembly will be forgiven. They made the wrong statement. They made Liba Namima. They made a word that should not have been said. So it goes to show again to just sit down and talk about the importance of La ilaha illallah is heavy in this deen. It's not one of those issues, come on man, let's just get it done, let's keep it moving. And unfortunately, the ummah, we don't have sabr in most messages concerning the ta'aleem and ad-dawah to la ilaha illallah. These political groups in al Islam, and I say it without biting my tongue, without speaking out of the side of my neck, all of these groups in al Islam are not permissible to have. None of these groups. And Ikhwan al Muslimin, Jamaat al Tabli, the different Turq al Sufiya, even a group that calls itself Salafi, and the people have Hizbiya towards that group, and fanaticism towards that group, towards the Sheikh of that group, or the leader of that group. They have Hizbiya towards themselves. All of that is haram. There's only one group in Al Islam, and that is the Firqa al Najiyah. Prophet Mitchell saw this woman is going to break up into 73 sects, all of them will be in the Hellfire except one. The companions in showing us, we have to know who this sect is. Who are they? He said, Ya Rasulullah, who are they? He said, The people who are doing what I'm doing today are my companions. That's the only group we're supposed to belong to. That's it. Every other group, Sedefi group, Khwal Muslimi, Jamaat al Islam, Jamaat al Tabliq, Al Shadaniya, Al Burhaniya, Al Mu'tazila, Al Qadariya, Al Shiite, all of those groups are haram, haram, and in the hellfire. All of them, all of them, in the hellfire. I don't put the individuals or from those groups in the hellfire, but those groups are going to be rejected from the Qiyam. The only group that Allah will accept is what the companions were upon of Dwan Allah, Alayhim, Ajma'in. So some of those groups are political in their nature, like Al Jamaat al Islam, Al Khwan al Sinin. This Arab Spring that has happened. They call it Rabir al Arab, the Arab Spring, where Muslims tried to topple their governments and they started to demonstrate. This was encouraged by the Muslim political groups. And as a result of that, as has been their history for the last 60 or 70 years, the political groups, is that any time they're in control or they're at the forefront of something, it's going to be confusion, fold up. So they were encouraging this thing. And look at the Muslim world today. Look at the Arab world today. Some people on the understanding. Can you imagine you people, uqala, uqama, you got the aqal and you got wisdom. Anybody here in his right mind thinks that the Arab world, the Muslim world, is in a state of stability right now? These people are the oppression that this is what we have to go through in order to see the Khalifa on the other side of the mountain. And that's not Islam. Islam didn't want all of this for us. Islam wants to protect the lives, the blood, and the honor of the Muslims. And anytime there's an opportunity where their blood, their lives, their honor, their deen is going to be threatened, Islam says, hey, get rid of that for right now. Don't introduce that right now. But some people, their religion is the political approach. The political approach is, let's create this stuff. And when it's created, people actually understand that this is the religion. And this is the the sifting out and the, the dividing that Allah makes to divide the hot from the bottom. Because the understanding of Islam is warped and crazy. But the point is, many of you don't know, but I'm telling you from experience, and this is the point I wanted to make, the political oriented Muslims, Hezbu Tahir, these groups, they say, until when are you going to talk about a Tawheed? Until when are you going to leave off explaining all of this Tawheed? What we have to do right now is, we got to deal with this bad leader. What we have to do right now is, we got to get the kuffar out of our country. What we got to do right now is, we got to get power and honor back to the Muslims. What we got to do right now, none of that is going to happen. Allahu alam, without the tawheed of Allah azza wa So the point is, we don't have sabr with this issue of the tawheed. Although the Prophet of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, called to a tawheed for the duration of his prophethood, 
and all of his brothers from the prophets and the messengers called to a tawheed for the duration of their prophethood. It is the reason why Allah created the heavens and the earth, the Jannah and the Nar, sent down the books, and why he sent down all of his messengers. And then someone comes and says, until when are we going to talk about the tawheed? Until when? Hopefully, inshallah, from the cradle to the grave. That's the answer. That's the understanding that is correct. As it relates to today's Dara Sikhwari, we're going to deal with the conditions of at tawheed the Sharupa of at tawheed Some of the Rulema said that they were seven, some said five, some said six, some said seven, some said eight, some said nine. So let's just say, Ahi, you have a book in which they said at tawheed was six, the conditions were six. And he had a book he found where a scholar wrote a book and he said that there were eight. It's not accepted, acceptable for him to say, no, it was seven. And he said, no, it was eight. No, it's seven. No, it's eight. Oh, you don't tell it. Oh, you don't love Islam. And they're fighting over those issues. This is the time that we're living in tolerance. Six, seven, and this issue makes people upset. Someone had a picture of a WhatsApp profile. I thought it was a nice picture. It had two men, one standing there and one standing here. And to this man, it was number nine. And to that man, it was number six. And he was saying nine. And he was saying six. And they had their swords out, getting ready to fight. And they had Ummah of al Islam. No, nah, it's six to him because it's his pers perspective. From where he's looking, it's six to him. And he's allowed to read it as six. He's not, you can't force him to read it upside down. And from his perspective, it's nine. And he's allowed to read it as nine. It's not haram for him to read it as nine. Even if it was really six. It's really six. Because the guy who came and drew the number, he drew it from his perspective and that's what he wanted. But this guy is reading it from a perspective that would allow it to be nine. So that guy on the other side has to understand that and tolerate that. The way our old man is Suleiman. Suleiman says seven, Abu Usama said eight, only one number between us, and we're going to shed blood over that one number. Now, Allah is one. If someone comes and says Allah is two or three or whatever, if there's only one number difference between that, we're going to make a big deal about that because they're touching upon and compromising a tawheed. So we're dealing with the conditions of a tawheed. The conditions. Many of the ulama of the past, they spoke about the conditions of the Tawheed. They don't come to us because the Prophet them said the conditions of Tawheed are this or this or that, that. They don't come to us like that. This is a very important point. They come to us through what is known as istiqra. Istiqra. I wish I had a blackboard to write this on it, but you write it the best way you can. Istiqra, like the word qara'a, qara'a, qira'a, qara'a, qaf, ra, alif. And you know, those of you who know Arabic, there are the wasns in the Arabic language, the different scales of things. So if you put istaf'ala, ali, seen, ta, before the word, like ghafara, istaghfara. Ghafara is how it's supposed to be. But if you put ali, seen, ta before that, Istaghfara, it means something. Fataha, fataha, to open up something. Istaftaha, if you put alif, sin, ta, before the thulati verb, it means something. I don't want to go too far, but this is important. This is really important. Okay? Salama, salama, like Islam is from that word. Salama. Istaslama. So in Arabic, if you put alif, sin, ta between a verb that's fulati, then it's going to give you it's going to give you the meaning of seeking something out. Istafta. You're trying to open something. You're looking to open something. You're looking for that. Istafara. You're looking for Allah's forgiveness. You're seeking something. Ista'lama from ilm, alam, ilm, ista'lama. You're looking and searching for knowledge. So istiqra, istiqra. 
Istiqra. What does it mean? It's very important. Istiqra means you come to a conclusion about something based upon the consistent pattern that is being shown to you. So if you read the Quran from the beginning to the end, from the beginning to the end, you're going to realize there are three types of Tawheed in the Quran. Tawheed al-Rububiyya, Tawheed al-Guruhiyya, Tawheed al-Islaw al-Sifat. From Istiqra, not because the ayah said there are three types of Tawheed, the hadith said there are three types of Tawheed, la. But every time you read the Quran, you're going to, write, you're going to find it, Qul wallahu ahad. The names of Allah, the Tawheed of al-Rububiyya, the Tawheed of al-Guluhiyya. So this is the way you get an istimba, istimba. وَلَوْ رَدُّوهُ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ وَإِلَىٰ أُولِ الْأَمْرِ مِنْهُمْ لَعَلِمُهُ الَّذِينِ يَسْتَنْبِتُونَهُ مِنْهُمْ وَلَوْ مِنْهُمْ وَلَوْ لَا فَضُلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَتُهُ لَاتَّبَعْتُمْ الشَّيْطَانَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا So getting these extracting, that's what is good translation, to extract. How do we know about these nine conditions? Because if you read the Quran and the Sunnah, you're going to see these nine conditions come up with the proofs. So some people, they said eight, some people said seven, because they will consider two of the conditions as being one, for an example. Two of the conditions as being one. Or they didn't consider one of the nine as being from the conditions, but they are from the conditions, inshallah. I hope you guys get that. I hope you guys have that. How do we know that there are three types of the Tawheed? How do we know that there are nine conditions of La ilaha illallah? Is there an ayat that says that? Kalla. Is there a hadith that says there nine? No. We know it from Istiqra. 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 I want to hear you guys say that word. I'm going to say it and you're going to say it. Istiqra. It was Qalqala. Istiqra. Good job, good job. And the word qara'a comes from that. Quran, Quran, qira'a. It comes from that. You just add on alif, the hamza, the seen, and the tab to any verb, any verb in the Arabic language. Any verb. That's furati. It has three halfs in it. If you put alif, seen, tab before it, then that verb, whatever that verb is, and you put alif seen tab before it, it means you're seeking whatever that verb is. al ghufran You're seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're seeking something. And that's the beauty of the Arabic language. We're not here to get deep into the linguistics of the language. Concerning the conditions of la ilaha illallah. Scholars of the past spoke about these conditions, like Ibn Taymiyyah, like his student, Ibn al-Rajab, like his student, and Imam al dahabi and even before them, the ulama, they said, Tawheed is the key, la ilaha illallah is the key to al-Jannah. But like every single key, there are teeth, asnan, li kulli miftah, Anybody ever see a key without any teeth on it? Anybody ever see a key like that? Doesn't exist. There's no key that is smooth and straight. Every key, it has grooves, teeth, that fit the lock. You put it in the lock, you turn it, and it'll open. If you have the right key with the right grooves, the right teeth, the door will open. The way it is with the Ummah today is, that la ilaha illallah is the key to Jannah. It's the key to Jannah. It's the key to Jannah. No doubt about it. But the key that's in the mind of many of the people as a race of la ilaha illallah is a clear, untouched, flat key that they think you just put in the door and the doors of Jannah open. La ilaha illallah. Mm -mm. The doors of, of Jannah open with the correct understanding of this land with salat is one of the key, one of the teeth, as zakat, sawm, hajj, hijab, all of those issues are from the keys. Person doesn't pray at all when he talk about la ilaha illallah gonna get me into jannah. You disqualified your la ilaha illallah when you don't pray. 
So those ulama, they said, yes, there are conditions. La ilaha illallah, it has teeth, conditions to it. First condition is the condition of al-ilmu, al-ilm. The condition of al-ilm. You have to know what it means. You have to know what la ilaha illallah means. La ilaha illallah, ikhwani. Some people, they translate it as being there's no God but Allah. And that's not true. Because the Christians have a God. Jews have a God. People are atheists. They have a God. And that they follow their own desires. Have you not seen the one who has made his God his desires? That's his God. Some people, their God is power, money. Everybody has something that they're worshiping. His, his, the female is the God of an individual. A husband, the wife is the God. The car is the God. The God is that thing that the person worships. That thing that that person is willing and ready and able to sacrifice any and everything on his behalf. Some people, their business is their God. So if a person is given total attention to something, that thing can become their God. That's why that ayah is really important. قُلْ إِنَّ الصَّلَاةِ وَالنُّسُكِ وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَلَمِينَ لَا شَرِكَ لَهُ بِذَارِكَ مِرْتُ That ayah is important. My life and my death before Allah. My sacrifice is for, my, for Allah. Nothing else is going to get me to that point and that degree where I'm going to allow it to come between me and my love or my commitment to Allah. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ told his companions, لَوْ كُنْتُ مُتَّخِذًا خَلِيلًا لَتَّخَدْتُ أَبَا بَكَرْ خَلِيلًا وَلَكِنْ أَخِي وَصَاحِبِي He said, if I were to take and make someone my Khalil, it would have been Abu Bakr. But Abu Bakr is my brother and my companion. The Khalil, like Ibrahim, is the Khalil of Allah. The Khalil is the friend that you love the most, more than anybody and anything else. Anybody and everything else. This person right here, I love him more than everybody else. Could be a wife, could be a husband, could be a mother, could be a father, could be that individual. Whoever he is, is your Khalil. Prophet Muhammad said, I don't have any other Khalil, no Khalil. Allah is my Khalil. Allah is my Khalil, that's it. The one who totally, absolutely covers up and he encompasses all of your heart. He said, Abu Bakr would have been that person. My best friend would have been that person. But even he is not allowed that station. Abu Bakr is my sahib and my ahi, lower than the khalil. So the point is, nothing was allowed to compete for the love and the affection of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Nothing, no thing. Aisha said, when he came into the house, كان في مهنتنا. He was in our service. Something needed to be done. He would help us to do it. She said, but when the Adhan went off, he left us like he didn't know us. He left us. When the Adhan went off, he left. Inside of the house, he helped them, what you have to do. And don't get it twisted and misunderstood. That ethic, that hadith doesn't mean that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put on an apron and Rasulullah was cooking and stuff like that. Because some feminist people use that hadith going crazy and say, see, Rasulullah did the housework. So Allah didn't do the housework. Rasulullah so took care of the things that pertain to him. He didn't always leave it for his wife because some of us, our culture, the way we are, the wife cooks everything, puts it down on the floor. He won't even pick it up. And that's your job. And the fact that I'm going out to work and I'm earning and I'm doing all of that, you do your part, I do my part. But it's nothing wrong. In this case, we say, okay, pick it up. Because Rasulullah used to help his wives as it relates to issues like this. As for over the stove and stuff like that. And then we call him up. We say, Ahi, are you going to come out to play football with us? Are you going to travel with us? Are you going to go for the lecture? Are you going to do it? He's saying, no, no, no. I'm cooking today. I've got to babysit today. If you want to do that to help, I'll do that. No problem. But don't think that the Prophet was doing that. Rasulullah was in the house. And jihad was going on and he was in the house cooking. He said, this is my day to cook. It wasn't like that. Because we heard that from people. Knowledge. Knowledge is the first one in Khwani. Knowledge. 
we have to have knowledge of this kalima. Wallahi. I don't know how many messages are here in Bedford, but knowing where the people come from, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, they're the majority of the Muslims. So they're going to usually have a majority of the messages. So as I mentioned so many times, they have Ya Allah, Ya Muhammad in these messages. People are making dua to other than Allah Azza wa calling on the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So people don't have knowledge about the meaning of La ilaha illallah. Now there are many delusions for this. It's going to give you one hadith and one ayah. One ayah and one hadith. Allah told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَّهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَالصَّغْفِ الْمِذَنْبِكَ وَالْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ Ya Muhammad, know that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. And seek refuge in Allah, forgiveness for in Allah for your mistakes. Seek forgiveness, this is the of Allah for yourself, for the believing men and the believing women. So the Prophet was commanded, Fa'lam, the fa as sababiya. Because of this, al kalam al musfiq al sabit. Because of this, Fa'lam, annu la ilaha illallah. So you should come to know. And Imam al Bukhari, concerning this ayah, one of his chapters in Sahih al Bukhari is a chapter called Kitab al Ilm. Kitab al Ilm. Many, many books in Al Imam al Bukhari. Bab al Ilm. Bab al Ilm. He began the chapter of the importance of knowledge with this ayah. And then he wrote Al Ilm. Knowledge precedes statements and actions. You have to know what you're doing before you do it. That's his general issue, Afi. That is a general issue. Know what you're doing before you do it. Before you put your foot down, make sure it can go there. Before you do this ibadah. A group of people were sitting from the Ramadan and the Medina. And one of the sons of the companions, his name is Abdullah ibn Shakhir, he was there. So there were evil things that had started to creep into the community and to the behavior of the people. So these students of knowledge and these sheikhs were sitting there, and they're religious people. So someone came up with the idea and they said, hey, hey, all of us, we see how our community is, right? So let us take a contract between ourselves like a bayah, a contract between ourselves, just us, that we're going to do an amr bin ma'ruf and a nahi al munkar And we, 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 collectively, we're going to encourage each other to talk against all of these things that are going on in the community. Do you agree? He said, yes, I agree. Put my name down. You agree? Yes, I agree. Put my name down. You agree? Yes, I agree. As if they're making like a bayah or a ahim. Ah, an agreement. When it came to this son of the companion, Abdullah ibn Shakhir, they said, do you agree? He said, no. And everybody looked at him. Because, hey man, why you want to be unlike everybody else? Keep it the program. When the sheikh said so, and said, no, he said, hey, everybody relax. This is the son of Shakhir, the companion. He, he has some information. Let's see. Why don't you agree? He said, because I read the Quran and I read the Sunnah. And I never saw anywhere in the Quran or the Sunnah where the Prophet Sallallahu encouraged people to take a bayah inside of the big bayah or to take a contract inside of the other contracts. So this thing that we're doing, if we open up the door to do this, then we'll do a contract to make salah in the masjid. Then we'll do another contract to drive under the speed limit. Then we'll do another con and on and on and on and on and on. And then the religion becomes new. He says, so I'm not doing something that there's no proof that would allow us to do this. Yes, there are ayahs in the Quran about taking care of your contracts and conditions. No doubt. Don't bring a general ayah, a general hadith, and mu'minun ala shurutihim. Hadith said, Muslims have to take care of the conditions that they made. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu awfu bil'uqood 
Oh, you believe, take care of your contracts. But those general ayahs are talking about when you get married and you put conditions, live up to that condition. If you get a job with someone and they put conditions, live up to that condition. Those ayats and ahadith are not talking about make a new contract for everything like that. So the point here is Abdullah bin Shakhir, Rahmatullahi alayhi, that thing that he did is what we have to do. We have to say, hey, where's the proof of that thing? Before I do it, I need the proof. And you all know what happened with Zayd ibn Thabit when Abu Bakr and Umar came to him and said, we want you to put the Quran together. You put the Quran together, the Musab. He said, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to do that. They said, why not? He said, because the Prophet didn't do that. Said, I'm not doing that. And then they had to convince him with the proofs. And then once he heard those proofs and the way they were being used, he said, okay, I'm going to do it. So knowledge has to precede everything. You want to get married? Get some knowledge. In the deen and the dunya as well. Want to learn how to drive? Get knowledge. Learn how to drive by getting in first, and then you get the thing. So, as it relates to this condition, that's the first hadith, ayah, first ayah. Know that there's no God worthy of worship except Allah. فَعْلَمْ إِنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَا إِلَّا اللَّهِ As for the hadith, then we have the authentic hadith that's been collected by Imam Muslim. And it's hadith number 26 if you want to go back and check it. Uthman ibn Affan, he said that the Prophet says of Allah wa alayhi wa sallam, مَنْ مَاتَ وَهُوَ يَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَّهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ He said anyone who dies and he knows that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah, he will go into the Jannah. So some people may take this for granted and just says, everybody Muslim knows. Every Muslim knows la 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 that ain't true. And the hadith of the Prophet shows us that as well. So Allah said, Munkir and Nakir, when the people come and they will say to him, Men Rabbuka, who's your Lord? Some of the people are going to say, Ha ha la adri. Oh, I don't know. Although he said Allah in the dunya. And although he thought Allah was the creator, sustainer, although he knew Allah orchestrated all of this, he knew that, but he didn't know the names of Allah, the attributes of Allah, the, the, the distinct nature of Allah, who he was, who he was. He didn't know that. He had that all mixed up. That's the first condition of Quran. There are other proofs, but uh, we're just going to deal with those two. The second one is, the second condition of la ilaha illallah, person wants to get into the Jannah, let them know these conditions, let them have knowledge of la ilaha illallah. Number two, is that he has to have a yaqeen as it relates to la ilaha illallah. He can't be in any doubt. He can never say after embracing Islam, once he was a Christian and he became a Muslim, he can never say to himself, is it possible Isa may be the son of Allah? He can never say stuff like that or think like that. Is it possible that maybe Islam is not the truth? Can't be like that. He has to have absolute yaqeen, surety, and certainty that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. He is by himself. And the dilemma of that are many as well. Like in Surah al hujurat Surah al hujurat Allah Ta'ala mentioned, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا وَجَاهَدُوا بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الصَّادِقُونَ Allah said in the Quran, Verily the believers, the true believers, are those people who believe in Allah, and they believe in the Messenger of Allah, and they have no doubt. They never doubted that, ever. They are the people who wage jihad with their persons and their monies in the cause of Allah. And they are the truthful ones. So the ayat described the real believers. In Nama, this thing in Arabic, Adat al sharat is important. Adat al hasr it means something is being uh, contained. In Nama, whenever you see that, 
in the Arabic language. You know that hadith where the Prophet means Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam that Allah sent him to complete the good character, to perfect the character. That hadith shows, Innama bu'ithtu, Innama I have been sent to perfect the character. The main goal and objective of why Rasulullah came, based on the Arabic of that hadith, is to complete good character, to make people better people. But I thought he was sent with Tawheed. I thought he was sent with Tawheed. Tawheed is from the good character. Because if a person has Tawheed, and he knows Allah sees him and hears him. So he's going to act accordingly. His character is going to be accordingly. So why he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Nothing will be heavier in the scale Yom al other than good character. Nothing is heavier than good character in the scale. But what about that other hadith? Where la ilaha illallah will be put in the scale. And it's going to outweigh everything else. The hadith said nothing is more heavier than good character. It's the most heaviest thing. The most heavy thing. But la ilaha illallah is going to be the heaviest thing. So it goes to show, yes, he was sent with Tawheed. There's no conflict, no contradiction. He was sent with a Tawheed. But... Good character is the main reason why he was sent. And what helps develop good character? Tawheed. What helps develop bad character? The less Tawheed a person has, the worse his character is going to be. Make mistakes, doesn't make total. Doesn't fear anything. Do anything, say anything, no problem. So this ayat of the Quran goes to show, Inna Verily the true believers are those people who believe in Allah the Messenger and they don't have doubt. Also, the authentic hadith, Abu Huraira, that was collected by Imam Muslim, and this hadith is hadith number 31 in Sahih Muslim. From the Muhammad told Abu Huraira, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam, Man naqeeta min wara' had al ha'idda, yashhadu wa la ilaha illallah, nustaykin in biha, qalbihi, fa bashirhu bil jannah. Ya Abu Huraira, anyone who you meet, comes from this door, anyone you see coming through this door, and he bears witness to La ilaha illallah with yaqeen, give him glad tidings, he's going to go to Jannah. You have to have, you have, to have yaqeen about this kalima, can't be in doubt about it. Something you have to be sure about. And why is that important? Especially some of you guys from East Africa, some of you guys from Gambia, where we come from, the Pakistani brothers. When we go back to our countries to visit or whatever, we're back in our countries and we see the confusion that our people are in as it relates to a Tawheed. When you start giving Tao and educating the people in a nice way, people get upset with you and they get mad. And many people don't want to listen. It's times like that where doubt may set in. It's times like that where the person starts saying, why am I doing this? They're not listening to me. And they want to crack my head open as well. They threaten, because I've been in situations where there was some serious animosity between the du'at of a tawheed, like in Sudan, in the 80s. I went to Sudan. There's a group of people they call Ansar al-Sunnah and Muhammadiyah. People were calling to tawheed. And in Sudan, there were a lot of Turkmen Sufia, people saying crazy stuff, believing crazy stuff. And these people who were on the Sunnah, they had a lot of activity, the shop. They would travel from where I was at, Medini, well at Medini, go all the way to Kesara, all the way to Kesara, to Darfur. They would go to Ubay, far, far places, far places to give dawah. They would go in the marketplace and start giving dawah to a Tawheed. The people would come, hit him in his head and put him in a coma. They would beat him up, kick him in his face, kick him in the butt, make him beat him into a pole. Because it was hostile. Back then, it was hostile. Because the people didn't know. And as the Arabs say, Men If someone doesn't know something, he'll have enmity towards it, animosity. So, you're in that situation, and you're giving down it, it, it a tawheed. The media, they'll come in and say, you're extremists, you're nonviolent extremists, you're this. The people will be against you, you're this, you're that. 
And then you start to, Shaitan comes at that time and he says, when you're weak like that, what are you doing? You need to relax right now with this Tawheed, you know. Just take it easy and do what everybody else is doing. Just get some Starbucks and relax. And that's when he becomes weak. And he starts having doubt. Shuck. Am I doing the right thing? You have to have yakin, yakin, and don't stop with it. Don't be afraid of the people. Number three. Number three. The third condition, ikhwatifillah, is al-qubul. Al-qubul. What is al-qubul, ahi? Ah, in English, in English, we're in America, we're in UK now. And then. So I'm calling on you. Accept it. Al-Qubur. You have to accept it. As I told you, God, Ikhwani, you go into some of these masajid, many of these masjids, and you start educating the people about our Tawheed every week. A khutbah about Tawheed, the lecture, something about Tawheed, in different ways. The community will get upset with you and say, what are you doing? And your answer is, I'm doing what the prophets and the messengers did. I'm doing what Allah commanded us to do. What do you mean, what am I doing? His tasawwur, he doesn't have sabr with it. That's our condition, our ummah. And I do say, we have to take it easy with our ummah. People were rough and tough, and the way that they give down to our ummah, they are a problem. A sheikh, Abdelaziz of Baddus, again, I saw this on someone's WhatsApp, and I believe everybody should put this on his WhatsApp two times in a day. Not in order. I'm just encouraging you. The Sheikh said, we are now living in the time of gentleness. The time of being gentle. Because the Ummah, the Muslim nation, is steeped in ignorance. They don't know. So we have to give dawah to the people in a gentle way, in an easy way. That's the Sunnah. As for people who claim they have the Sunnah and they're rough and tough and nasty with people, something is inherently wrong with your down. We shouldn't put the Muslims down. The guy who came into this religion, he reverted to the religion and the people who gave him the religion didn't know what they were doing. So as they say, the one who doesn't have something can't get it. So they gave him what they have, which is nothing. So when I'm dealing with him, take it easy with this guy. He's not nasty. He's not against good. The Muslims who were born and raised in Islam, many of them don't know what they're doing. They not know what they're doing just because they're bad people. This is what happened. So all of us, all of us in this community right here, those of us who know, whatever you know on your level, be easy and gentle in the part of that knowledge to your kids and to the other community from the Muslims before the non-Muslims, before the non-Muslims. And I really believe when you're part of the fitr of Benny Adam is that if you talk to people with respect and you're easy and you're gentle and you talk to them like you care, the fitra will accept that type of kalam from people, usually. Especially people who are like us, basic people. We're not rich, we're just basic people. Now rich people, that's something else. Rich people, when you approach them, they're on another level. They don't like you talking to them in the first place. They look at your color, they look at your dress, they look at your social status, they look at how much money you have, and all of that gets in the way for them. But just regular people like us, approach them in a nice way. So now, concerning this issue of Qubur, you have to accept it. Many, many adilla. From them is what Allah said about the Kufar Quraysh, and it's the disbelievers in general. وَإِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَحْدُ شْمَا أَزَّدْ قُلُوبَ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ if Allah is mentioned by Himself, La ilaha illallah. If Allah is mentioned alone, Ishma azzat qulub al ladina la yu'minuna bil ahira. Those people who don't believe in the last day, they are enraged and they get upset. When the Prophet said to the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La ilaha illallah, they said, What? What is He talking about? Has he made the guys into one? In the heart of the shame, Rujab, that's something that is miraculous. But if you call Allah and Al-Uzza, Allah and Manat, 
Allah and Isa. Allah, this, that, they may be compatible. They're satisfied. They didn't have qubul. So if you call on Allah by himself, they got a problem. That's one of the delils from the Quran. Another delil from the Quran is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا ذَقِيلًا لَهُمْ لَا إِلَهَا إِلَّا اللَّهِ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ Verily, they were a group of people who, when it was said, لَا إِلَهَا إِلَّا اللَّهِ, they became arrogant. وَقَالُوا أَإِنَّا لَتَالِكُوا آلِهَتِنَا لِشَاعِرٍ مَجْنُونَ They said, shall we abandon all of our gods for a madman who's a poet? They didn't accept it. As for the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, شَوْمْ قَبُولٍ there is a hadith, Ikhwani, Musa'il Bukhari, a Muslim. We have to study this hadith one day. And inshallah, I want you guys to go back and get this hadith. This is your homework assignment, inshallah. Go back and read this hadith. It's Musa'il Bukhari, and it's Musa'il Muslim. And Bukhari is hadith number 79, and a Muslim is hadith number 2282. Man, this hadith is so high powered and so nitroglycerin in the way that the Prophet taught, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, the example, my example, he's teaching the people. He said, my example and the example of what Allah sent me with from guidance and knowledge is like the example of some rain. Pay attention, guys. He said it's like the example of rain. The rain came down and it hit the land. And the land absorbed the rain and brought it forward and then threw out its vegetation. When the rain mixed with the ground, with the, with the soil, that good fertile soil, that soil throughout a Ruman and Ina and Tamar and Tufa and Burtukal and Al Mos and all of that. A rose, everything. Because the land was 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 fertile. Prophet Muhammad said, My example and the example that Allah sent me with guidance and knowledge is like the example of rain that came down and it hit the ground, and the ground absorbed it took it in, and then threw out its benefit. That's the example of the people who learn their religion. They read the Quran, they learn the Quran, they teach the Quran after learning it. Their knowledge is rain. It comes down to them. The sunnah is rain. Came down, he took it, and then he passed it on. He absorbed it, and he gave it to the next people. Like this masjid, this masjid is on a level that I believe which is higher than it used to be. And it came as a result of what? By Allah's tawfiq. It came as a result of people taking the guidance and the knowledge and they sent it out. And that other people embraced it. And, and, and things are being done here that wasn't being done before. That's the first example. Those people took the knowledge and then they threw it out. They practiced it and they called to it. He said, and then there was a second land. And the second land, the rain came down and it benefited the people. It absorbed the knowledge and it benefited the people how? They caused their animals to drink from the water and to eat. And they benefited. And they themselves, they made wudu and wusul and all of that. But they were not teachers. Those ones, they didn't go out well giving down. But there's benefit. And then he said, and this is the point right here, the third group is the group he called the Ard Qay'an. Qay'an is the art, is the earth that the rain comes down and it doesn't go inside of the rain. It stays on top of the ground. It's a puddle. It stays on a puddle. They didn't bring it in, and if they didn't bring it in, if the water was not absorbed, then nothing can be thrown out. It's just on top of the earth. Prophet Muhammad said, that is the example of the person who doesn't pay attention to what I brought. He turns around, well, he doesn't pay attention. Some people are like that with la ilaha illallah. Some people are like that with la ilaha illallah. So that hadith from Sayyid Bukhari Muslim is a delil about al-qabool. Al-qabool of la ilaha illallah. There's no knowledge 
more important than that, ila ila Allah. Ya ayyuha alladheena aminu istajibu lillahi wa rasul ila da'akum lima yuhyikum. O you believe, answer the call of Allah and his messenger when they give you that call to that which will give you life. Nothing will give you life more than la ilaha illallah. Al-Qabool. That is number three. Number four, Ikhwani, Al-Inqiyad. Wal-Istislam. I need you guys to write that word in uh, transliteration the best way you can. Istislam. Istislam. I S T I S. Is this lamb? That means to submit. To submit. Is this lamb? Al inqiyad or is this lamb? So from the conditions of la ilaha illallah is that the individual has to submit to it. Can't fight against it. Can't be opposed to it. Can't be opposed to it. What is the proof of that? There are a number of proofs. But again, we'll just give you one or two. Allah says in Surah Luqman, Luqman, ayat number 22, And whoever submits his face to Allah, and he is a muhsin, and he is a muhsin, he has grabbed on to the al urwat al And to Allah is the final determination. This is a very important hadith of ayah. Showing, La ilaha illallah, you have to submit. The ayah said, Wa man yuslim wajhahu illallahi wa huwa muhsin. Anyone who submits his face to Allah, he becomes a Muslim. He submits his face to Allah, to La ilaha illallah, wa huwa muhsin. And he is a muhsin. Muhsin here means a wahid. He is a person of tawheed. He submits and he is a wahid. The ayah said, فَقَدْ إِسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْأُرْوَةِ الْوُفْقَى He has held on to the hole that never breaks. And we already told you last week, one of the formulas of La ilaha illallah is an urwatu wufqa. Do you guys remember that? Do you guys remember that? The ayat of the Quran, Surah Al Baqarah, Anyone who disbelieves in the ta'wuti, believes in Allah, he has grabbed a handhold that never breaks. What's that handhold that never breaks? Ibn Baz said, Ibn. Abbas said la ilaha illallah. So that hadith, uh, ayat 20 is a delil for you have to submit to la ilaha illallah. Number five, and we're almost done. It's not even complicated, easy, is a sibq. A sibq. You have to be true to the word. You have to believe in the word. You have to believe in the word and have sibq. Be musaddiq. And what's being said, you um, believe, I think, is the best translation. Like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said that the Prophet was a sadiq wal masduq. The one who is trustworthy, the one who is believed. He's trustworthy and you should believe him. So with la ilaha illallah, you have to have sit, you have to have. You know, my belief in it, as opposed to rejecting it. You have to have a sit, you believe it. Someone comes and tells you something, you don't say he's a kadab. He's coming to tell you about la ilaha illallah, and you're like Abu Bakr, you say, I believe. So you become subdiq. That's what sit is here. Not just belief like iman. Someone is telling you something, something's on the table, and he's telling you, La ilaha illallah. You don't say to him, you're a liar. And that's why when Abu Bakr and Umar, may Allah be pleased with them, hey, where you going, son? Huh? All right. You young brothers, if you ever leave the dust, I want you to get my attention by raising your hand like that, 
and pointing to the door to get permission to go out. You guys have that? So let's say you have to go to the toilet or something like that. Don't just get up and go out. You get my intention and you do like that and you point and make the face like that. And if you got to go, point to the window like this. I know you're going, you're not coming back. But don't just walk out like that, okay? i tell you why later on, inshallah. As Sith Abu Bakr and Umar had a misunderstanding and they had an argument and Abu Bakr just left Umar and went to the Prophet and told Rasulullah Umar said this and did this and did this and he said that and made me upset and this and that. Umar had went to Abu Bakr's house to apologize said, where is he at? They said, he's not here with the Prophet. He went to the masjid he saw him there. He came and he started walking and said, Abu Bakr, forgive me, I didn't mean it. Rasulullah was angry and he said to Abu Bakr and to Umar and the rest of the people, Hal antum tarikuli sahibi? Why don't you people leave my companion alone, Abu Bakr? Leave him alone. Verily I came to you all and you said I was a liar. I was lying. I came to Abu Bakr and he said, You told the truth. I believe you. So he became a Sadiq. That's the meaning of Sith here. So you don't just think it's Iman, I believe, like no, 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 no. Sit, the opposite of Kevin, where you don't reject it, you accept it, you believe in it. Because it's different from Kabul as well. Kabul, where you accept it, embrace it. I'm not talking about that. We're talking about something totally different. Sit, the opposite of Kevin. You didn't believe in it, you didn't reject it, you accept it, you believe in it. That's one of the conditions. What's the proof of that? Another ayat as well, the beginning of Surah Al Ankabut. Allah Ta'ala mentioned Alif Lameen, a Hasiban Nas when you truck when you pull Abedna, whom I use the moon, when a Kada Fatan the Ladin and Kablihim, for the Yalaman no law Ladin as Sadaku, when a Yalaman Nelkabibi. Do people think they Alif Lameen? Do the people think they're going to be left alone by just simply saying we believe and they're not going to be tried? Verily we tried. We gave trials and tribulations to those people who went before them so that Allah will know the people who have sinned over the people who are lying, over the hypocrites. You know the hypocrites, they say, yeah, we believe, we believe. But as soon as it gets hot, you put a little bit of fire under the feet, put a little fire in the chair. As soon as that fire touches the person, I mean, you see where he's really at. And this is one of the benefits of Hawaii about trials and tribulations in our lives. Fitness. If Islam was a religion where everything was like a walk in the park and everything was cookie crunch, hunky dory, everything was just roses, everything was roses. No struggle, no problem. Everybody would be a Muslim. Everybody would be a Muslim. But Islam is not like that. Islam is a religion where people are going to be against you. So people don't want other people against them. People don't want to be discriminated against. They don't want to be denied housing, denied a job. They don't want that. People want to be under the radar, just living their lives. But if you're a Muslim, forget about it. You can't be under the radar. You're going to be above the radar. Because as soon as the people see you with your wife, you're above the radar. She got to go outside with the hijab. You got to go outside with your lehya. Now, there are people going to try to get under that radar now. They're going to try to get under that radar. In many ways, they're going to get under that radar. And that's why we have to, we have to be careful of the magic of the dunya. The magic of the dunya. You know the magic of a sikh with the Sahara, with the magicians? Allah told us that that magic had the ability, Harut and Marut, they taught people magic that would separate a man from his wife. And that's terrible. But the magic of the dunya, the allurement of the dunya, will separate a man from his Lord. Be separated from your wife any day of the year. Get another one. And she get another husband. But if you separate yourself from Allah, your Lord, you ain't going to get another Lord. And the one that you get, 
The replacement is not the Urtu Wufqa. Allah is the handhold that never breaks. So these trials and tribulations, Allah gives them to the people to see who has sick. And Kalimatu La ilaha illallah is filled with trials and tribulations. So that's one of the delils. As for the Sunnah, from the authentic Sunnah of the Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam, is the hadith that the Nabi said in Sahih al Bukhari, hadith 128, and Sahih Muslim, hadith number 32. Alice ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi wa sallam, Ma min ahadin yashhadu wa la ilaha illa Allah wa anna muhammadan rasulullah sidqan min qalbihi illa harramahu Allahu ala nar There is no one who bears witness to la ilaha illa Allah muhammadan rasulullah with sidq from his heart except that Allah makes the hellfire haram upon him And he used that word so we understand sit is a condition. The Prophet used it with La ilaha illallah. Nobody bear witness to the shahadatain with sit from his heart except that the hellfire is haram. And the meaning of the hellfire is haram is he won't be in the hellfire forever. Doesn't mean he won't go to the hellfire. He may and he may not. But if he does, he won't be there forever. Number six, Ikhwani al-Ikhlas, al-Ikhlas, al-Ikhlas. We will translate al-ikhlas as being sincere, sincerity. You have to have sincerity to this kalima of la ilaha illallah. He mentioned in the Quran, فَعْبُدِ اللَّهِ مُخْلِسِ اللَّهُ الدِّينِ أَلَا لِلَّهِ الدِّينُ الْخَالِسِ Worship Allah with sincerity and establish for Him the deen, the religion, the way of life. And verily to Allah is the pure religion. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينِ They were only commanded to worship Allah alone with ikhlas. لَا أَعْبُدُوا مَا تَعْبُدُونَ I don't worship what you people worship. You people don't worship when I worship. So that is al-ikhlas, al-ikhlas. As for the hadith, it's the Sahih al-Bukhari. Abu Huraira said, Ya Rasulullah, من أسعد الناس بشفاعتك يوم القيامة Who will have the right for your intercession يوم القيامة? Who will be the happiest person from amongst us to receive your shafa'ah? He said, Abu Huraira, I didn't think anyone would beat you to that question. I didn't think anyone would ask me that question before you because I see how you're a student. I see how you come to the class. I see how you write. Pay attention, you ask questions. I see you giving down and educating people to what you learn. I see that in you. You're paying attention. I didn't think anyone would ask that question before you. And then he says, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam, As'adu nasi bi shafa'ati yawm qiyamati man qala la ilaha illallah khalis min qalbi. Allah gave us ikhlas. He said, The person who will be the happiest most joyous person Yom Al-Qiyama as a result of my intercession will be the one who says La ilaha illallah with ikhlas with ikhlas so when we sit down subhanAllah 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 alhamdulillah 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 La ilaha illallah wahduhu la sharika lahu lahu al-mulku lahu alhamd yuhi wa yumitu wa ala kuli shayt qadir with the differences that you make in that dhikr, maghrib and fajr is one way, and then the other three prayers is a different way. But when you sit and you say that, and you think about those dhikr, think about it, and say it with ikhlas, say it, and you put the time in to say it. Sometimes, put the time in. You pray at home, you pray in a masjid, put the time in. You say that you know, a lot, 100 times. He said anybody who did it 10 times will get the reward that he freed a slave who was one of the sons of Ismail. Not just any slave, but a son of Ismail whose father was a call to Tawheed and he was a call to a Tawheed. 
because of this statement that you know like ten times in the dhikr. So the point is, say it with al ikhlas. Give da'wah to it with al ikhlas. I know some people, ikhwan. They know some basics about the Tawheed. They know some proofs here and there about the Tawheed. But when they relay the message of the Tawheed to the community, the outer community, the Muslims who don't know, they run the people away. They're rough and they're tough. And they speak to them in a condescending way. You people are from Gambia, I'm talking to you. We go back to Gambia and some of these other places in Africa, and the people really don't know the Tawheed. Pakistan, Allah's Rasul, Hazal, Nazim, and all that stuff. So when we talk to people, we give them da'wah to that, and that, and we're giving them delil. But the fact that we're rough and tough can be a sign of an indication. You're not mukhlis, ya akhi. You're giving da'wah to overcome the people. You're giving da'wah to overwhelm the people. You're giving da'wah to chase the people away to make yourself look good, like you're special because you embraced it, grasped it, and they didn't. So dawah has to be with hikmah and with rahmah. And the knowledge that we give to the people, hey, the knowledge that we give to the people, and I'm talking about the amatinas, the dawah that we give to the people, we have to. When you want to give a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of ilm, it requires a ton of hikmah, a ton. A little bit of knowledge requires a ton of hikmah. And unless you know the people, you have to take it easy and relax. If you know the people and you ingratiated yourself to the people, then obviously you could be a little bit rough and tough. A little bit. One hand is going to wash the other hand. As it relates to my wife, as it relates to my children, and vice versa. But people who don't know me, they're on the fringe, they don't they they're just being exposed. You have to be easy. People invite me, come to our masjid. We want to give people da'wah tawheed. Okay, I'll come, I'll do that. Uh, we want you to do the talk. And the talk, and you can tell from the title of the talk, they want to fight the people. And you don't give that kind of talk to people like that. You don't announce that kind of talk to this type of community. I'm going to go to the masjid for the brethren. Our brothers from the Brewies who don't know. For the first time that I'm going to go to that masjid, the brothers want my talk to be Prophet Muhammad's mother and father in the hellfire. Is that, is that wisdom? As soon as I start talking about that, even if it's the truth, people are not ready for that. So that choice is a sign you don't have a class to this kerima, or something's wrong with you. You lack an experience. Something's wrong with you. So yes, a person may have knowledge about these things, but how does he put it across? How? To people who don't know. We have to put it across the way the Prophet did. So Allah like said, gently and easily throughout the course of his life. But when his companions that were on the deen compromised Tawheed, he dealt with them. My man who said, MashaAllah, was shifty, Ya Rasulullah. It happened because you and Allah wanted to happen. Rasulullah took his finger and said, Have you made me a partner along with Allah? And he started poking a man in his chest like that. Have you made me a partner along with Allah? Say, MashaAllah, wahdu. Say, MashaAllah, by himself. That's it. So when the man looked at the thing, he saw he had a mark on his shirt. Because the Prophet knows that man. He dealt with that man like that because he knows Abu Bakr and Marath man, they can handle it. But the Bedouin, he can't handle that. Go ahead and let that Bedouin do his thing. Let him do his thing. Let him urinate. Let him say whatever. One of the greatest scholars of our time, the Sheikh Nasr al Din and al Bani, who was not Ma'asum. But al Bani used to debate people. And they would travel across the world to go and debate different people. People who were on his dial and people who weren't on his dial. I used to listen to those debates. And I can see sometimes al Bani being an older man, he would put his personality on the person, like right? The students who were on the sunnah. 
it was debating with someone about the goal that is in a circular form and that person was the opinion that all of that goal is haram even on women if it's a total circle but it has to be able to be split she can't wear a gold ring a gold bracelet it has to be something that is not a total circle so they were debating that he has pros he has scripts and bang was cutting him off during the course of the thing and that person has to be quiet out of respect so you can see Alec Benny was using psychological ploys as well to deal with him. But I saw Alec Benny and heard him debate someone who was young and he didn't know the religion. And that guy was saying all kind of crazy things. And Alec Benny was laughing. He was lighthearted. He was easy. As you and I listen to it, we get upset. Why is he saying that? Why is it? And the man was laughing, like joking. And the people around, he was telling them, relax, relax. And then the guy left, the youngster left. And he explained how you think this young child is ever going to embrace the dawah if we jumped on him about everything he said. And then it was an amazing munabara, amazing how his chest is wide open. You know how we have to be with our kids. Our kids. Some of them are just small like that. We have to accommodate that level of understanding and not treat them like they're adults. Because they're not. That's how we have to be, Khwani, giving the doubt a lot. So, al ikhlas, al ikhlas, even the way we give doubt to these people. Next one, number seven, is al muhabba. Al muhabba. Sulaiman, what do you think Al-Muhabba translates as? Al-Muhabba. Al-Muhabba. To do with love? To do with love. What's love got to do with it? i going to explain to you. Al-Muhabba. You have to have love for this kalima. Love for the kalima. Love for its people. Love for its creator. For its messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Love for the books of it. Do you guys know one of the special qualities of Alul Hadith is that Alul Hadith are called Alul Hadith because people want to be connected to the Hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whereas all of the, and I'm not talking about Alul Hadith Pakistan, Bangladesh, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Alul Hadith people from Tanzania, Alul Hadith people from Somalia. I don't hadith people from Bangladesh. Just meaning I'm from the people of Hadith. I'm not talking about a group. I don't hadith Bangladesh, Pakistan. Bro, we deal with the I don't hadith. I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about what Imam Ahmed said. And Imam Ahmed. When he talked about the Firqa Tanajah, that hadith. This Ummah will not cease to be victorious. Imam Ahmed said, if these people are not Ahlul Hadith, I don't know who they are. They said, who are Ahlul Hadith? He said, the people work by the Hadith. So, these other groups, their names come from either an individual or some slogan, some idea. Every group that you can think of. It comes from some slogan or some individual. A Jahniya, Jahm ibn Safwan, al kulabiya it's going to be named after somebody, something, or a slogan. Whereas al hadith not like that. al sunnah not like that. al ghuraba not like that. The firqat al not like that. It's all being connected to a hadith. All being connected to the Qur'an, so on and so on. And people love and hate based on these issues. You gotta love and hate based upon the haq. Would you accept if someone called you a Mohammedan, like you're a Muslim? They say, you're a Mohammedan. You're a Mohammedan? I say, man, I ain't no Mohammedan, man. I ain't no Mohammedan. Somebody said to you, you're a Wahhabi, you're a Wahhabi? No, I'm not a Wahhabi. What is a Wahhabi? A Wahhabi to the Muslim world is the one who follows or listens to Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, what did he do that was so bad? He went out and he gave dawah to the community in his area 
where the people were worshiping graves and rocks and trees and shiyuch and khurafat and bid'ah and shirk. And he stopped that. Is he perfect? No, he's not perfect. He make mistakes like everybody else. Like everybody else. But our community, this kid right here, he stops going to his cultural masjid, he comes here. They say, this is the masjid of the Wahhabis, right here. I know Wahhabi. Anybody a Wahhabi here, put your hand up. I need to know if there's a Wahhabi in the house. Is a Wahhabi in the building? Yazo, and the Wahhabi ahi. Is there a Wahhabi in the building? We all gonna say, man, don't call me no Wahhabi. Don't even call me a Muhammad. I'm Muslim. I'm a Muslim. I'm not none of that stuff. Why is this Ummah against a Wahhabiyah? I'm not here to defend that name. I'm against that name. We don't follow Hamid ibn Abdul Wahhab. We don't follow Ibn Taymiyyah. We don't follow Bukhari. We don't follow Imam Malik, Abu Hanifa. We follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And anybody, anyone who brings what he brought, we're going to follow that. Wahhabi. They don't like this guy, this man, because he gave down to Tawheed. His book, Kitab al one of the best books, author. So the community, they're upset with it. If the youngster breaks away from the religion of the elders who are doing all this stuff, they're going to say he's a Wahhabi. Is Wahhabi a word in Tanzania? They use that word? Wahhabi, do they use that word to describe people? Like, do the, some of the Tanzanian people say he's a Wahhabi? He went over to the UK and became back Wahhabi. Do they say that? Yeah, okay. I don't know, but I'm not sure about now. In Gambia, in Gambia, is that a word in Gambia? Do they say that in Gambia? Huh? They say that in Bangladesh. Huh? In Sudan, do they say that in Sudan? In Tanzania, they call it Now, now it's Qaeda, right here. So anyway, listen, Ikhwani, we have to have love for the word. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran and Surah and Baqarah, Ayat 165. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ And from the people of those people who they take partners along with Allah and they love their partners more than they love Allah whereas the believers they love Allah more they love La ilaha illallah our community, they love Allah. Really, I don't say they don't love Allah. But sometimes they love Rasulullah more, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What's the delil? What's the delil? If you make istihla, remember halafa, halafa. Halafa means to swear, halafa. So if you put Ali, Seen, Ta, before that, Istahlafa. So you're seeking for someone to swear. You're asking him to swear. Astahlifuka billah. I'm asking you to swear. So in the Muslim world, if someone says, Wallahi, I did it. Wallahi, I didn't do it. They'll be lying. They'll be lying. But if he says, What Nabi? I swear by the Nabi. You gotta tell the truth. Someone's looking at me like, as if people don't say that. Nah, he. Nah, he. Some Muslim countries, people want to make sure you're serious. If you tell them the story, you'll say, Ali can nabi. Ali can nabi, ah. <laughs> that means, Ali can nabi means, I'm asking you to swear by the nabi. But he may he my siwa hima. Three things. If a person has these three things inside of him, he will taste the sweetness of El Iman. The first one, Allah and His Messenger are more beloved to him than anything else. La ilaha illallah is more beloved to him than his wife and his children, all of that. None of you truly believe in two. I become more beloved to him than, he, than all of the people. Number eight. To disbelieve in the Tawarit. The Tawut is one, Tawut. And the plural is Tawarita. Tawut. 
and the definition of a ta'ud, as an Imam Malik said, kullu shay'in ubida min dunillah. Any and everything that is worshipped along with Allah is a ta'ud. Ta'ud is just not the bad rulers. We gotta get rid of the ta'ud, gotta get rid of the ta'ud, gotta get rid of the ta'ud, the ta'ud, ta'ud. The system is ta'ud, ta'ud. And that is not even the worst ta'ud. But his tasawwur, politics, is the main thing to him. The first word that they teach these people is not to me. Brand spanking new Muslim, the new Muslim, he's gonna learn ta'ud before he learns the meaning of la ilaha illallah, the correct meaning. And the ta'ud is the bad rule, the bad ruler. That's one of the meanings. But the most important meaning of ta'ud is anything and everything that is worshipped along with Allah. But, 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 do we say that Isa is a ta'ud? Kalla. Do we say that the sun, the shams is a ta'ud? La. The moon, ta'ud, la. The nabi, ta'ud, la. Because they're being worshipped along with Allah and they're not happy with that. They don't agree with that. Isa ibn Maryam didn't agree with that. Ya Isa ibn Maryam, anta qutu lil nasi attakhiduni wa ummiya ilahini min duni la. Qala subhanaka. I never said that, he says that I said. I never told him to say that. So that's the meaning of ta'ud. Anything and everything worship along with Allah. And they want it, they allow it. So the Nabi mentioned in that hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, none of you truly, none of you will taste the sweetness of the iman until you love Allah and His Messenger more than everything else. Second thing is, and that's the proof, that's the part of proof. Second one is that he loves a person and he only loves him for Allah's cause. You know, in our relationship here, Ikhwani, I think I can speak on behalf of most of you. The reality is, we get along with one another, we care about one another, simply because of the deen. Because nobody here is giving somebody else some money. Nobody here is paying <coughs> someone 200 pounds every week. If every week in my bank account <coughs> I receive 200 pounds from you every week for a whole year, I'm going to love you. I'm going to appreciate those 200 pounds. That will give me an incentive to say, hey Juma, where's that brother at? I want to know, where is he okay? And if he says he's sick, I'm going to send him a signal. Because this guy's giving me 200 pounds every week. It's an incentive. But that's not happening with any of us. None of us. We have love for each other, appreciation and concern for each other because of this deed. Because of this deed. So we hope and we pray to Allah that He gives us the, the ability to cultivate that so that Yom Qiyamah will go into a Jannah because of that. The angels were lying in wait and there was a man who was traveling and he died. They came to him. They said, hey, where are you going? He said, I was going to go visit a friend of mine. I was going to visit him for Allah's sake. I love him for Allah's sake. He said, does he owe you money? You're going to get the money he owes you? Anything? Some hot of yours? He said, no. I was just going because I love him. He said, then, because you loved him, Allah loves you. You're going to go to Jannah because of that love for the deen. And like Khwani, we have that with people of this ummah we don't even know. In Birmingham, in the last days of Ramadan, there were five brothers from Gambia. They were working and a big wall fell on them and crushed them to death. The wall was so big, it splattered them. Their bones, their bodies went everywhere. So they just had to bury them like that, bring the stuff together. They could have even been mixed up. His body parts are with his, you couldn't even tell. On the day of the Janaza that was in the park, it was almost like your Eid. It was probably like your Eid, more bigger than your Eid. When you looked in the audience, when I started talking in the audience, obviously a lot of Africans from West Africa. And it showed, the good thing of that showed how many Africans we had from West Africa. So it may be a bad thing that happened, but in it is good. A lot of Africans, a lot of Arabs, a lot of Pakistanis, and no people didn't even know them. 
I didn't know any of those people. But obviously the guy has got to tell the people, please come. I didn't even know them. Most of these people didn't know these people, nor did they know the people who were there. And it made me think back then about the universality of this thing. And that's our religion. That's our religion. But it's not unique to us. Christians also had that. Christians also had that. I don't think Jews had that, but Christians had that. Some Christian churches will embrace you. And they will even embrace you in a way that is better than Muslims. I know a brother from Gambia as well. He has Tourette's. You know Tourette's? Tourette's is something where it makes a person do like this. Or he screams out, makes noise, ah, like that. Can't help it. He can't help it. The more he tries to bring it under control, it's a mental thing. The more it goes against him. But when he's with people who know him, and you, he's relaxed, he doesn't have it. Because he's not thinking about it. He's comfortable with you. Like us. You know my hair right here? My hair stops right here now. It goes right here. Now I know I can sit with you people. Nobody's going to say, look how far his hair go back here like that. But now Muslims, they're like, they judging everything. Oh, too fat, too skinny, nose is real big, look at his ears, this, that, that. We don't care about that stuff. We embrace each other. That one white, that one tall, that one short. We don't care about that. Anyway, that brother was making salat of Taraweeh. And in the line, he said, Wow! Ah! Yeah! He's doing that throughout the song. And people were not educated. Our elders, they don't know what that is. They never saw that. They're praying behind them, next to them, and they're like, And you know our community, everything is the jinn, everything is the evil eye. <laughs> After each two raka, they were saying to them, well, what, are you, what are you doing? You, you need to go see a rocky. You, 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 you need, what, what are you doing? You're, and it was a big fit now. You know what the brother did? He abandoned Tarawi. Stop coming. I'm riding the bus in Birmingham. The bus, I'm riding the bus. A lot of people on the bus. A person with Tourette's is on the bus. And their Tourette's makes them swear. They say bad curse words. It's a mental thing. They say the worst curse words, swear words, the worst ones. But you can see he has Tourette's and he was doing that, saying a curse word. Christian lady who was handing out these things. Uh, um, what do you call those people? Huh? Nah, salvation army. The other ones, man, the Bible thumbs. Job a witness. She said to that. Uh, boy, don't, don't worry about the precious. Jesus loves you. And she was so gentle with him. Jesus loves you. And she was supportive and understanding. But the Muslims, we, we, we're not like that. We look at that and we say, the guy has a jinn, he's possessed. He's a rock. You need to find out who put that evil eye on you. Tell him to make ulu. Get the water and make with that water. Because you're crazy. <laughs> so I'm just not digressing. I'm just saying the muhabba, we have to have love for the kelim of the Tawheed and the people of the Tawheed, the books of the Tawheed. Our community is in opposition to the people of the Tawheed, Kitab of Tawheed. Our people are in opposition to that. That's what our situation is. Last one, Khwani, last one, is al nutqa al nutqa to profess it, to say it, that it has to be said. It has to be said. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the ayah that I told you already, إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا ذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا إِلَهَا إِلَّا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ The kufar, if it is said to them, لَا إِلَهَا إِلَّا They become arrogant. In the hadith in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim, hadith 27, 86 in Al-Bukhari. Hadith 21 in Sahih Muslim. Abu Hurara said that the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and nas hatta yaqulu la ilaha illallah faman qala la ilaha illallah faqad asama minni nafsu wa maalahu illa bi haqqihi wa hisabu wa Allah. Prophet Muhammad said, I have been commanded to fight the people until they say and pronounce la ilaha illallah. So anyone who says la ilaha illallah then his person, his blood, his honor will be protected from him. Except Abu Haq Islam. He has to say it. Prophet Muhammad's uncle was dying. He said, Ya Ammi, uncle, 
Qul la ilaha illallah. Say la ilaha illallah. This word, I'm going to argue in front of Allah on your behalf with it. Yom al -Qiyama. You must say it. It's a kalimah that you must say. So we get up in the morning, say la ilaha illallah. We get up from your seat, say la ilaha illallah. When you see something that is beautiful, la ilaha illallah. Something that frightens you, la ilaha illallah. Saying this word is important. You gotta come into Islam with this kenny. It's gonna come into Islam with this kenny. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, the hadith as well, he mentioned anyone who says la ilaha illallah, he disbelieves in everything other than Allah, then his money and his blood is haram. So those are the nine conditions of la ilaha illallah. The nine conditions of la ilaha illallah. You brothers have any questions, any cons comments, any corrections? Um, some scholars, I think, they put uh, the ninth one says uh, the adherence to it until you die. Can you come up with that? Say it again. Adhering to that shahada until your death. They put that as the ninth condition. Say it again. Adherence to adherence the death, to the condition until you until your death as the ninth condition. That's the ninth condition. Where at? He said some scholars said that. Oh, oh, oh some scholars said that. Uh, adhering to la ilaha illallah to the time of your death being one of the conditions in this case it would be the tenth one some of the ulama of Islam they said that I personally never heard that but doesn't mean that it's not true what I'm trying to do right now is think of a delil or a proof of that. And some things come to my mind, but they are not as clear as what can possibly be out there. So, the homework assignment is to find proof that scholars use to say, adhering to la ilaha illallah, adhering. To la ilaha illallah is a condition. Ayy, fuck. They use an ayah, Surah Al Imran, ayah 102. Where all oh, you believe, observe your duty to Allah with the right observance. Now, ya ayyuladina amin, taqu la ila tu tunna illa wa intu muslimun. Wa la tu tunna illa wa intu muslimun. And the other ayah as well. When. Yaqub said to his sons, what are you going to worship after me? And they said, we're going to worship your ilah and the ilah of Ibrahim. And he told them, don't die except as Muslims. Yeah. As for the Sunnah, maybe what we can add to that is the hadith of Udayt ibn Yaman. And he said that the people used to ask the Prophet about the good things, and he used to ask him about the bad things out of fear of them falling in on him. He said, Ya Rasulullah, we used to be in good. We used to be in evil in Jahili, and Allah brought us as good in Islam. He said, After Islam, is there any evil? He said, Yes. He said, after that, will it be good? He said, yes, and it will be smoke. He said, what is it, smoke? He said that there will be a group of people who will be going in accordance to other than my sunnah. He said, you should avoid them and stick to the imam of the Muslims and the jama'ah. He said, but what if there's no imam and no jama'ah? He said, then stick to the tree and be by yourself upon that truth 
until death comes to you. Stay like that until death comes to you. Don't waver and stuff like that. Hey, this is my first time hearing that. At Harris Tour. What was that? What's that number? What's the ayat? One in Ali Imran? Number one three. Two. One oh two. And Yaqub. In Hadra Yaqub. In Hadra Yaqub. And Yaqub. Any more? Shukran laka, I appreciate that. Ahi, Juma, Jazakallah khair. Any more questions, inquiring comments, additions, anything? You're going to tell us why we have to get your attention before we go? Nah, nah, you older people, if you want to, you can, if you want to. But for the youngsters, the reason why we request that is because from the etiquettes of getting knowledge is that you shouldn't just get up and leave, even if you have a legitimate place to go. There's an ayah of the Quran that Allah Ta'ala mentions, oh you believe if any of you wants to go on an errand while you're in the presence of the Nabi and seek his permission, when he gives you permission you can go. So because he was there teaching the people, the teacher now is not the Nabi, but it was the practice that when he used to teach them, you don't just get up and you don't just leave. And that's out of respect of what's being taught. The Prophet was sitting with the people of Salaam and he said, I want to tell you about three people. He said there were three people doing the class. One of them, he came from the back and he got all the way and he came to the front. He turned to Allah and Allah turned to him. And then there was another one who was shy. He didn't want to walk all the way in front and get close to the speaker, so he sat in the back. He was shy of Allah and Allah was shy of him. And the third one, he turned away from Allah. He turned away. He didn't want to sit and he went. So Allah turned away from him. So when you get up and you go, even if that's natural niyat, to make sure to prove that those people in the past from their etiquette was asking permission goes to show the person is not turning away making the Iraq and turning away from Allah's message. Like that hadith. And that's why it came to my mind that hadith about the rain. The third group were the people who didn't pay any attention to that whatsoever. They turned their back on it. They didn't pay any attention to it. So by getting and seeking permission, a person clarifies to himself and to others, inshallah, that this is not where he's coming from. Although that's not his near to be disrespectful anyway. And if we were to look at at the etiquette of the Senate when it came to knowledge, the Senate did a lot of things and there were things that they didn't do that we have to be easy with the people right now. You have to be easy, develop the people till they get to a stage or a point where you can start saying, don't do this, don't do that. The time I was giving a talk in Liverpool, and a brother started passing out cupcakes and juice. I told him, hey, 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 don't, don't pass them cupcakes out in that juice. Now is not the time for popcorn and crisp and all of that stuff. Because the ayat of the Quran said, my job Allah Allah didn't put two hearts in the one body of one man. He's going to eat cupcakes and juice and listen to the thirst at the same time. He's going to either be with you or be with them cupcakes and juice. More likely, going to be with the cupcakes and the juice. This is Petty Adam. He's going to spill the juice. He's going to want some more. So I told him, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't pass that out right now. And then he stopped. Another brother came and passed him out. So the companions were not like that. The telephones that go off. I know some sheikhs right now, if the telephone goes off and he says, hey, 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 turn your phones off. I was in the measures. He said, turn your phone off. One man phone went off. Turn your phone off. So he turned his phone off. The hadith said, as Sa'id, the successful one, happy one, is the one who learns from the mistake of someone else. 
So when the sheikh said, turn your phone off, what does that tell all of us? You can check your phone too, man. Check your phone too. Check your phone too. So his phone went off. He started talking. Another phone went off. The sheikh got up and he left. There were like 8,000 students in the Medjus, in the Prophet's Masjid. 8,000 students. Why did he do that? He did that to teach everybody. If we really looked at the Kalam of Allah, the Kalam of the Nabi, like those companions, okay, we're not like them, the way they were, the things they used to do. That we read about and we heard of, we're not like that. But at least we can show some respect and show it means something to us. Now, I wouldn't advise someone to do that here. His phone goes off so, and you get up and leave. Because we're not on that level. We don't know. Relax. Take it easy. But once we get to know, this is what we're going to do. It. <laughs> you know that happened to me though before. I, my phone goes off. Um, I'm going to get the hook and then the phone starts going off. So, so the point is, we wanted those younger brothers to begin to have an appreciation how to be students, appreciation for the speech that's being taught. Tab in the soon. Last question right here. Let's fuck them. So, I know a lot of brothers who will have a class, who have some of these conditions, but they will not be aware of other conditions. So, is this, these nine conditions would um, increase their knowledge and the level of demand? No doubt about it. In our religion, the demand goes up and it goes down. It goes up when we obey a lot, it goes down when we disobey a lot. In obeying a lot, knowing what you're doing, your demand is going to go up. If you don't know, it's going to go down. If a person doesn't know about something, he's not responsible for what he doesn't know. But if he's, he could be blameworthy for not knowing. So a person may have more ikhlas than he has qubur. He accepts it, but it's hard to implement, for an example. So everybody just has to make jihad in each of them. There's no single person who is even in everything in Islam. I said what? What he couldn't which hatun whom will be ha for study mukhira. Everybody has his path, you go on your path. So this guy is a pray, pray this zakat, this guy is this, he's that, that, that. So no one is a complete movement. Complete? That's only for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, Kwadi, we're going to uh, stop here. Inshallah, we hope to see you guys after two weeks. When the Hajj time comes, we are going to suspend the class, inshallah. How many of you brothers are making Hajj this year? Anybody making Hajj this year from this community? Anybody? How many of you perform Hajj from this community? Anybody perform Hajj? How many of you perform Umrah from this community? Bedford. Okay, khayy, inshallah.